message this morning is on the seal of God. There is much talk, of course, in the Christian world about the mark of the beast. Everybody knows about it, they are afraid of it, and there are many theories as to what it is, but there's something even more important, and that is the seal of God. What is it? How do we make sure that we have that seal as we are living in the last days clearly from Bible prophecy? We read last time about the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it's rolled up and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? What a fearful day for those who are not ready. Jesus coming in all of his glory, the glory of the holy angels, the glory of his Father, we read in the Gospels, all of that glory, all the glory that there is, will be at the second coming. And for those who are not ready, it will be a very fearful day. As we read, many will be crying for the rocks to fall on them and hide them from this glory that's appearing. 2 Thessalonians tells us that these wicked shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power when He comes in that day to be glorified in His saints. And so the question that ends chapter 6 is a very serious question, isn't it? Who shall be able to stand in light of all this glory. The only thing that would be able to stand in God's presence is something that would reflect His glory. Amen? Something that would be able to withstand the glory would be a reflection of His glory. And so the question that ends chapter 6, who shall be able to stand, is really answered in chapter 7. And that's where we are this morning. After these things... I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth. Now, what are winds in Bible prophecy? They represent strife or turmoil, right? This can be political. This could be calamities that are coming upon the earth. Really, when you're talking about four winds, it's an expression of every direction coming at the world in full strength. And these angels are pictured as holding back this strife that's about to hit the earth. A good example of this is in Daniel 7 and verse 2. When Daniel saw the four beasts coming up out of the sea, notice what the winds do here. Daniel spoke saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. Now what is the great sea? What is the sea in Bible prophecy? Multitudes, nations, kingdoms. And so the winds were stirring up, were causing strife among the people of the earth back in Daniel's time. But we know that what is about to come upon the earth is like nothing the earth has ever seen. This is taken from great controversy. She says, When the four angels finally let go and cease holding and check the malicious designs of Satan and the fierce winds of human passion, all the elements of strife will be let loose. The whole world will be involved in ruin more terrible than that, that came, which came upon Jerusalem of old. A very intense period of this world's history. Matter of fact, Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1 says it this way, And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be what? Delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. Now, just a simple question for those who believe in a secret rapture that will take God's people away before the time of trouble. What is this verse telling us? There's coming a time of trouble, and at that time, God's people will be delivered. Will they be in the time of trouble? Yes. Very interesting verse I found this week. Mark 13 and verse 27, speaking of the second coming, it says, And then Christ, He will send His angels and gather together His elect from where? From the four winds. Are they in the winds when God is gathering His elect? Yes, they are. God's people are clearly here during this time that the Bible says is such that has never been such a time of strife and trouble. 
Well, as we return to Revelation 7, it goes on to say, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. Now the earth is all-encompassing. The sea, we said, is multitudes, nations, tongues, people. And then it's as if God goes right down and says, don't even harm any tree until my servants are sealed. Now what is a tree in Bible prophecy? Very interesting. A tree would represent God's people. Isaiah 61 and verse, verse 3, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called what? Trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. We also see in Psalm chapter 1 and th verse 3, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. We see the likening of God's people to trees all through Scripture. I was reminded during Sabbath schools, I was just kind of pondering this thought, of Nebuchadnezzar. What was Nebuchadnezzar likened unto in chapter 3? A tree that was cut down because he wasn't responding to God at that time. And a band was put around the tree, and you know, the symbolism is clearly there. We see in the New Testament a very interesting story in Mark chapter 8 that Jesus heals a blind man. What makes it interesting is that when he heals this blind man, he does something that you don't see in the other Gospels. He actually spits. Remember the story? Man is blind, and when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. And the blind man looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. Now clearly, the, he didn't have all of his vision yet, did he? He was kind of saying they're, like, they're kind of like shadows. But I think it's interesting that he said they're like trees. Then Jesus put his hand on his eyes again and made him look up and he was restored and saw everyone clearly. It's as if the man needed two touches of Jesus in order to see clearly. That will become relevant as we move through the message this morning. In Revelation 7, it continues, Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. Now, looking at this passage, we have two very important questions to answer this morning. Number one, what is keeping the four winds from blowing in all of their strength. What is it that's holding back the winds? Well, it's the angels. Why are they holding back the winds? What, what, is, the, what is the delay? That's right. The seal has not been completed, has it? Now, question number two. Is it possible to be a servant of God and yet not be sealed? Yes. Do you see it in the passage? God is waiting for the servants to be what? Sealed. So it is possible to be a servant of God and not be sealed. This is what the delay is all about, isn't it? This is what is holding back God from allowing the angels to release those four winds. So clearly then, the seal is somehow just from what we've read so far, related to preparing God's people for this great time of trouble that's about to hit the earth. Does everybody see that? That clearly this seal must be on the foreheads of God's servants before the winds of strife are let go. In other words, there's a preparation in the seal itself that will help God's people to stand during that time. Now there's something very important we need to under understand about this word seal. In the scriptures, there are several places where the seal has already said to be administered. And it's different than what we're reading about here in Revelation chapter 7. Let me give you an example. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul says, Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God who has also sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. This word seal here is insinuating that you have been authenticated, that you've been accepted. 
And what is the, what is the, uh, the physical manifestation that kind of proves that you've been accepted? It's the giving of what? God's Spirit. Spirit. Everybody see that? You've, you've received this exception into God's family, and as a result, you are given His Spirit to show that that acceptance has taken place. Paul uses the word sealed there. It's a beginning. It's like entering into the work, whereas the seal we're reading about in Revelation 7 is a finishing of the work. All right, let me give you a couple more examples. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13. In Him, in Christ, you have trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed, and there it is again, with the Holy Spirit of promise. You've been accepted into the family of God. He has given you the Holy Spirit as an authentication, as a, as a representation that you have been begun in the work. Now, is it possible in that first sealing to fall away? Yeah, we have many examples of this. Ephesians 4 and verse 30, there's a, a very serious warning given. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit who's been given to you in other words, you were sealed and given this Holy Spirit. The work was begun. Don't grieve away that Holy Spirit or you could fall away. Wasn't it David in the Old Testament that prayed, God, do not take your Holy Spirit from me? Didn't he pray that? We also have uh, in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6, it says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of what? the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put Him to an open shame. The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, if you will. It is possible to be sealed into the work. God has started. He has granted you the Holy Spirit. But in this process, you push away. You fight against you grieve against the Holy Spirit and eventually, what happens? You fall away. You fall away. It's the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. So as we're thinking about the word sealed in this context, a beginning of the work, notice how Paul uses the same concept with the word sanctified. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 2. To the church of God which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who in every place call in the name Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Now you don't have to read very far in the book Corinthians to know that there is still a work to be done in the believers at Corinthians, right? There are so many problems in that book as you read through that you recognize they are not sanctified in the sense that the work is completed in their hearts and minds. Does everybody understand that? What Paul is saying is that they are set aside for the work of making them holy. They have entered in to the work of sanctification. But clearly, that work is not finished. I'll give you a good example. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, Paul says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you how much? Completely. In other words, there is more to do and may God do that work in you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Is it important to be sanctified completely before the coming? How will we stand? That's really the question we're asking this morning, right? And so the sealing, think of it as the, as the early reign in your life is that sealed term that we've looked at in several scriptures. Whereas the seal of God in Revelation 7 is the latter reign that completes the work. You're sealed up. You're finished. You are sanctified completely. Okay? Now there are examples in Scripture of types of this seal. One of the most popular and a very powerful one is the Passover. You know the story? They were facing the death angel and God told them to take a lamb. And they were to kill this lamb and they were to eat the lamb and then they were to take the blood and do what with it? Put it on the doorposts. Right? And so when the death angel would fly over, if he would see that mark, if he would see that seal, if you will, he would pass over. You wouldn't be touched. You wouldn't be hurt by that death angel. 
So, the Lamb, obviously, in this illustration, represented the Messiah, Jesus Christ. They had to kill the Lamb. He died for them. They had to eat the Lamb, which is partaking, putting it inside you. One, the death for you would be justification. The eating of the lamb would be sanctification, a work that's taking place in you. And the blood, obviously a sign of that justification, would be put on the doorposts, right? The seal, the mark. And the doorposts are very important because that's the entrance into your dwelling place, kind of like your mind, right? The entrance into who you are and what you are. And then the death angel, the four winds, would be just like that death angel, the destruction that's coming. God's people would be protected during that time. Now, it's interesting when you get to Deuteronomy, I just kind of threw this in here. The people were told to write God's law on their doorposts. Kind of interesting, and we'll see how that ties in in just a little bit, but it seems to insinuate that the blood and the law are very similar in this illustration. Now, what was the test? What was the test during this whole process? Simple. Obedience, wasn't it? I mean, it just comes down to that. Did God provide everything that they needed to perform what He asked them to do? It was all there. Now, what would have happened if they would have killed the lamb, ate the lamb, but not put the blood on the doorpost? The firstborn would have died, right? What if they would have killed the lamb, put the blood on the doorpost, but not ate the lamb? Partial obedience, not good, right? You see what I'm saying? In this, this illustration, the test was simply submitting to what God had asked them to do. That's all it was. Now, as we return to Revelation 7 and verse 3, till we have sealed the servants of our God, where does the sealing take place? On the forehead. Now, if we compare that to Revelation chapter 14 and verse 1, the same group of people, which we haven't studied yet, we will next time, the 144,000 is mentioned. This time, listen how it reads. I then, I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. Is there a clear parallel between the seal being on the forehead and God's name being on the forehead? Clearly, they are the same thing. Now, why that's important is because in Bible times, as you well know, a name meant something, didn't it? When people's character would change, what would God do a lot of times with their name? He would change their name. Jacob, who meant deceiver, when, when he wrestled with God, his name was changed to mean one who overcomes Israel. And you have several demonstrations of that in the Bible as God changes people's names. Saul changed into Paul. Many of those types of illustrations. So, ultimately, whose name means everything? It was God. And when you look at God and the attributes of who He is in the Scripture, you will see that whatever the Bible says about God and His character, it also says about His law. God is spiritual. His law is spiritual. And you can go right down the list. God is love. His law is love. And so it would make sense that this seal that God wants to put on the servant's forehead. The, the same thing that is His name written on their foreheads would be equivalent to the law of God. That's why we have texts like Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 16. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. And ultimately, isn't this the new covenant? Right? Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 16, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their what? Minds I will write them. This is the whole purpose that Jesus came and died for us, so that He may redeem us, write His law in our hearts and our minds, sanctify us completely that He might take us home. That's it. I mean... Look in your Bibles with me to Daniel chapter 9. I'm going to show you some interesting things. <laughs> Daniel chapter 9. And we'll look at verse 4. Here Daniel is praying. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 4. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God, 
who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. Do you see the covenant relationship here? The new covenant was to put his laws into our hearts and minds, right? And Daniel's recognizing that you are the great covenant-keeping God and you keep your covenant with those who love you and keep your commandments, right? Now, since we're in Daniel, just turn, turn over to verse 27. Daniel 9 and verse 27. Here, Jesus again, the Messiah, is represented as one who confirms this covenant. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. You see, the, this is the whole purpose of the Messiah. He's the covenant keeper. He's the one that wants to write the law in our hearts and in our minds. Now look at chapter 11 and verse 22. Chapter 11 and verse 22. Here, in this very intense prophecy of Daniel 11, we have a short word spoken about Jesus here. With the force of a flood, they shall be swept away from before him and be broken, and also the prince of the covenant. So Jesus is even referred to as the prince of the covenant. He's the one that wants so badly to make a covenant with you, to write that law in your hearts and in your minds. Look at, look at how the enemy hates the covenant. Look at chapter 11, since we're already there. Verses 28. We'll read first verse 28. While returning to his land with great riches, his heart shall be moved against the what? The Holy Covenant. Speaking about the papacy here, the, the enemy of God. So he shall do damage and return to his own land. Look at verse 30. For ships from Cyprus shall come against him. Therefore he shall be grieved and return in rage against what? The Holy Covenant. And look at verse 32. Those who do wickedly against the covenant he shall corrupt with flattery. But the people who know their God shall be strong. You see how really this, this whole message of the sealing of God's people is about the covenant. And who would hate the covenant? Satan would hate it. He would war against it. Jesus said in the New Testament very simply, If you love me, keep my commandments. If you want to demonstrate your love for me, don't say that you love me. Don't proclaim that you love me. Show it. Keep my commandments. There's a problem, though. There's a problem with humanity. Fallen humanity. The humanity that all of us possess. It's interesting as, as God is reviewing with Moses the giving of the law. And he says how God heard the people say, all that you have said, we will do it. And notice the emotion that I sense in this verse here as God speaks to Moses. He says, oh, that they had such a heart. Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me. Always keep my commandments that it might be well with them and with their children forever. There's a heart problem, isn't there? And so God has to do something in order to make this covenant relationship, this writing of His law upon the heart and the mind, solidify into this fallen humanity. I would like to share something with you this morning as we progress through this message that I hope will be a help to you. You know, I've pondered as we've talked about the perfect obedience that God wants from us, how much the human heart shrinks and fears statements like that. I feel it, and I know you feel it. I have discussions with many of you, and we talk about how we can keep the commandments of God and all how I see in the faces of those I talk to, the deer in the headlights look. What? I can't keep God's commandments for 10 minutes is what we feel, right? I want to share something with you that I hope will give you a peace this morning. Job chapter 34 and verse 20. In a moment they die. In the middle of the night the people are shaken and pass away. The mighty are taken away. And then this phrase is mentioned here. Without a hand. What does that mean? without a hand. When you, when you see that in Scripture, without hands or without a hand, what, what does that insinuate? This was a work of God, not man, right? This was supernatural. This was without human intervention that this happened. Well, we see many examples of this. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 34. You watched while a stone was cut out 
without hands. Who is the stone? It's Christ, right? This is supernatural. This is without human intervention that this stone will come down and crush the image. Does everybody see that? In the New Testament, Jesus was accused of saying that he will destroy that temple that took them 46 years to build. If you destroy this temple made, how was it made? With hands. Within three days, Jesus said, I will build another made without hands. Now, was Jesus talking about the physical temple? The, the big edifice there in Jerusalem? What was he referring to? His body. Now, how was it that his temple was made with hands and then made without hands? Well, you have the physical body and then you have the resurrection body, right? With hands, in other words, Mary played a part. Divinity came into humanity and it was sort of a mixing of the hands of men, if you will, and the hand of God. But in the resurrected body, it says, I will build another made without hands. Paul says the same thing in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. For we, the, we know, and he's talking about this, this earthly vessel, the body we have, that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house, what? Not made with hands. Now these are spiritual examples of the supernatural taking place where God intervenes without human intervention, right? But, what if we take this concept and apply the spiritual concept rather than the physical? We're told in 1 Corinthians 6.19 that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? In who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 says that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become what? New. Let me submit something this morning to ponder. Jesus said, if you destroy this temple made with hands, I will rebuild it without hands. God wants to destroy your temple. Because the temple has been made with hands. And He wants to rebuild it without hands. Now let me just hang with me here. I know this is, you're, you're trying to get ahead of me. You're, the wheels are spinning. Just, just hang with me. Colossians chapter 2 and verses 9 through 11. Speaking of Christ, For in Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in Him, who is the head of all principality and power. In Him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made how? Without hands. In other words, did you do the circumcision? Did your neighbor do the circumcision? Who did it? God did it. And what is this spiritual circumcision that he's talking about? The putting off of sin. Right? This is God's work, is the good news that I have for you this morning. When we talk about God perfecting His people, a people keeping the commandments of God, is this man's work? Or is this God's work? This is God's work. Now just stay with me. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 3 Paul recognized that he needed to keep his hands off, right? For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence where? In the flesh, none whatsoever. If there's going to be this heavenly circumcision happening, Paul's saying, I have no confidence in what I can do. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, says, For we are His workmanship, Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Whose workmanship are we? Whose? God's. Right? Have you, ever, um, have you ever been building something, for those who have small kids or had at one time, you're working with something that's very important to you. I don't know, put something in there. Um, uh, something for work or anything. Anything that's delicate, anything that you've worked hard on and, and the little kids are running around and you have to leave the room to get something, right? What is your main concern as, you, as you're, you know, you're walking out of the room and you're doing this? What are you worried about? They're going to touch it. <laughs> They're going to mess it up. And so sometimes you'll even say, 
Keep your hands off that, right? Don't touch. When it comes to this work that we're talking about, God is saying to us, hands off. This is my work. I will do this. Now, don't get nervous on me. There is something that, there is a part that we have to play. Don't get nervous. You know me well enough to know that I'm not going into the realm of we do nothing. But as far as the work, the holiness that He wants to work in you, the obedience that He wants to work in you, the righteousness that will dwell within you, who does all of that? God does it. God is doing it the whole time. Look, Ephesians 5, 25 and, and 26. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for her that He might sanctify. Who's doing the sanctification here? God is. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we already read this. Now may the God of peace Himself sanctify you. Who is doing the sanctifying? God is. Isn't it God who said in Philippians 1.6 that I will complete the good work that I started or begun in you? Whose responsibility is it to complete the work? God said, I will do it. Hands off. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 12, Therefore Jesus also, that He might sanctify the people with His own blood, suffered outside the gate. Who is doing the sanctifying? God is doing it. Every time, God is doing it. God is doing it. You see, righteousness, when you think about righteousness, it really has two levels, doesn't it? There's justification. Does God provide everything for the justification? Can you bring anything to the table? Nothing. Right? Then, over here, there is sanctification. A setting apart for holiness or a making holy. Right? To be sanctified, to be made holy. Who does that according to all the scriptures that we read? God does it. See, the devil would like us to believe that justification is God's work, but sanctification is man's work. Have you ever thought that way? You have justification over here. This is God's work. He does all that. But then he kind of winds you up and says, go get him. Is that the way that it works? No, the whole time, whether you're talking about justification or sanctification, it's all the same as far as who is doing the work. God is doing it. Look, Colossians, or Christ Object Lessons. I see C-O-L, and I immediately think Colossians. Christ Object Lessons. She says, this robe of righteousness, woven in the loom of heaven, has in it not one thread of human devising. Christ, in His humanity, wrought out a perfect character, and this character He offers to impart to us. All our righteousness are as filthy rags. Everything that we of ourselves can do is defiled by sin. Do you see that? Not one thread of human divisiveness, human devising, is in this robe of righteousness. She continues, and here is our work, by the way. Everyone's waiting. Well, we gotta, we're, we're part of this somehow now. It doesn't all happen by itself. Here, it, here's the only thing in this whole process that we must consistently do. All right, You want to be encouraged this morning? You're afraid of perfection? You're afraid that God can't work out His righteousness in you? This is all you have to do. This is, this is doable. When we what? Submit. When we submit ourselves to Christ, the heart is united with His heart. The will is merged in His will. The mind becomes one with His mind. The thoughts are brought into captivity to Him. We live His life. This is what it means to be clothed with the garment of His righteousness. <coughs> then as the Lord looks upon us, He sees not the fig leaf garment, not the nakedness and deformity of sin, but His own robe of righteousness, which is perfect obedience to the law of of Jehovah. Isn't that good news? We submit. God will begin to work. The will becomes, you know, combined into His strength and does the supernatural. Last day events. Just as soon as the people of God are sealed in their foreheads, it is not any seal or mark that can be seen, but a settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so that they cannot be moved. 
It's a settling into the truth. That's the seal of God. That's the finish of sanctification. When God has so worked within you and you've allowed Him, you've submitted to the point where you cannot be moved. That's good news. So you have a picture up there of a, a potter working with clay. Right? We're the clay. He's the potter. Very simple. Now what happens when the clay begins to rebel against the potter? It hardens in ways that the potter never intended. And what will the potter do with that clay? He can't use it. He can't use it. And so all we have to do is submit. He's the, he's the potter. He'll work us into the vessel that He wants us to be. We are going to settle into righteousness or we're going to harden into sin. You know, 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12 says, Do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is about to try you. How do you, ha how do you harden pottery? You fire it. Right? And as God is working His righteousness in uh, us, trials, temptations come to you, and the Holy Spirit is saying, Don't do it. Submit. Submit. And you say, Yes, Lord. Hands down. Hands down, Lord. Hands down. You, can, you do it. As soon as that happens, Christ can mold. And as He molds, He fires. And in the firing process, you are settled or hardened into the truth. Once pottery has been hardened, can it be moved? No. It will not move. And that's why the servants of God must be sealed. They must be hardened. They must be fired into this present truth, if you will, so that when that final devastation and test comes upon the world, they will not be moved. They will not. Acts chapter 17 and verse 24. Now think about this through what we've just learned. God, who made the world and everything in it, since He is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples, what? Made with hands. So the real question this morning is, your temple made with hands? or without hands. Because He will not dwell in a temple made with hands. If our, if our own strength without God's divinity is trying to do the work, He cannot dwell there. He will not dwell there. He will not dwell in a temple made with hands. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 22. You know, we've all heard the term self-justification, right? But have you ever heard the term self sanctification wouldn't that be just as wrong as self uh, self justification look look at this group of people in Matthew 7:22 they come to him on that day and they say lord lord have we not prophesied in your name cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name what are they saying lord look look what i did with my hands right what does Jesus say to that group of people? Depart from me. I never knew you, you who work iniquity or sin. But, but, and they're saying, but, but look what I did. Didn't I? Didn't I? Didn't I? Jesus says, this was, a, this was supposed to be hands down. This was my work. And you took it upon yourself. You were trying to sanctify yourself. Can't have it. No one will get into the kingdom with self-sanctification. Here's a really powerful one. Isaiah chapter 66, speaking about the second coming of the Lord. For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with His chariots like a whirlwind to render His anger with fury and His rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by His sword the Lord will judge all flesh and the slain of the Lord shall be many. It's that glorious coming. His glory is... is destroying countless people who have not allowed Him to be Lord of their lives. And then look what it says. Those who do what? Sanctify themselves and purify themselves. And what are they doing? Eating swine's flesh and the abomination in the mouth shall be consumed together, says the Lord. Why, why is this in here? Because as with anything, whether it's diet or you know, throw anything that you're struggling in there, if you are not coming to the Lord and saying, I can't do this, Lord. I'm putting my hands down. You have got to do this. Help me, Lord. I'm submitting to you. I know what your will is. Now you, you come in and give me the strength to do it. If we fight against that, 
And we say, well, I know what the Word of God says, but I am going to... What are we doing? We're fighting against the potter. We're grieving against the Spirit. And we're basically, as the Bible says, trying to sanctify ourselves. It will never happen. The seal of the living God. Now, and, and notice how I waited to read these, these uh, statements I'm about to read. Because I think there has to be such a foundation laid before people understand the severity of these statements. Sometimes we throw these statements out front and people just, the deer in the headlights look goes on and they shut down mentally because it's just so overwhelming. But if God is doing the work, this is not so bad, is it? Now let's listen to the statements. The seal of the living God will be placed upon those only who bear a likeness to Christ in character. Well, that makes sense. If He is molding the pottery, if He is creating His own creation, then He can do with it what He wants, right? And so I'm okay with that. Early writings. Those who receive the seal of the living God are protected in the time of trouble, must reflect the image of Jesus fully. Well, as long as He's completing the work and He's promised... I will complete the work that I started in you. I'm okay with that. Because He is faithful and just, is He not? Testimonies, Volume 5. The seal of God will never be placed upon the forehead of an impure man or woman. It will never be placed upon the forehead of the ambitious, world-loving man or woman. It will never be placed upon the forehead of men or women, of false tongues or deceitful hearts. All who receive the seal must be without spot before God candidates for heaven. Now again, if I don't understand that it's just me submitting and God doing the work, I might be afraid of statements like that. But once I understand that it is God who justifies, it is God who sanctifies, and all I have to do is submit, that makes things a whole lot easier to bear. Now, I want to share with you another very scary passage in the Bible. But again, understanding what we do now about the seal of God Hopefully, it will make more sense. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 9. Ezekiel chapter 9. And this is basically the sealing taking place here as Ezekiel sees it in vision. Ezekiel chapter 9. We're just going to read the whole chapter. Then he called out in the hearing with a loud voice, saying, Let those who have charge over the city draw near, with each with a deadly weapon in his hand. And suddenly six men came from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with his battle axe in his hand. One man among them was clothed with linen and had a writer's inkhorn at his side. They went in and stood beside the bronze altar. Now the glory of God, the God of Israel, had gone up from the cherub, where it had been, to the threshold of the temple. And he called to the man clothed with linen who had the writer's inkhorn at his side. And the Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. You see, the instruction is given to put a mark on the foreheads of those who are concerned, very concerned, about the sins that are taking place in the city. Verse 5. To the others he said in my hearing, Go after him through the city and kill. Do not let your eyes spare nor have any pity. Utterly slay old and young men, maidens and little children and women, but do not come near anyone on whom is the mark. And begin where? At my sanctuary. Where does judgment begin? At the house of God. So they began with the elders who were before the temple. Then he said to them, Defile the temple and fill the courts with the slain. Go out. And they went out and killed in the city. So it was that while they were killing them, I was left alone and I fell on my face and cried out and said, O oh Lord God, will you destroy all the remnant of Israel in pouring out your fury on Jerusalem? Then he said to me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great. And the land is full of bloodshed, and the city full of perversity. For they say, The Lord has forsaken the land, and the Lord does not see. And as for me also, my eye will neither spare, nor will I have pity, but I will recompense their deeds on their own head. Just then, the man clothed with the linen, who had the inkhorn at his side, reported back and said, I have done as you commanded me. Ezekiel is overwhelmed 
as he is seeing in vision this happen. And he say, Lord, will you destroy the entire city? And God says, this is a work that must be done. Why? It's a, it's a likening to the shaking. Because God's church here represented in the city, the dwelling, or the, the capital, if you will, of God's people, is full of iniquity. It's full of people who are self-sanctifying who have turned from the truth and God says, I can't use this and I have to finish this work. Now notice the question that is asked in verse 8. If you just turn to Ezekiel 14, God says it, He answers that question a couple chapters later in Ezekiel 14. This ties right in to the last days. Ezekiel 14 and we'll begin in verse 19. Here God says, If I send a pestilence into that land and pour out my fury on it in blood and cut off from it man and beast, even though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, says the Lord God, they would deliver neither son nor daughter. They would deliver only themselves by their righteousness. For thus says the Lord God, How much more it shall be when I send my four severe judgments on Jerusalem. How many? Four. How many winds were there? Four, to cut off or the sword and famine and wild beasts and pestilence, to cut off man and beast from it. Verse 22, Yet behold, there shall be left in it a... What? A remnant. There will be left a remnant who will be brought out, both sons and daughters. Surely they will come out to you, and you will see their ways and their doings. Then you will be comforted concerning the disaster that I have brought upon Jerusalem, all that I have brought upon it, and they will comfort you when you see their ways and their doings, and you shall know that I have done nothing without cause that I have done in it, says the Lord God. What we're about to face, what is ahead of us, is a fearful thing. What is about to take place in the church as we're approaching this last days will be very, very hard to watch you will see people leaving in drones. You will see the church turned upside down like you've never thought was even possible. But God says, hold on. When you see the results of what I am doing, you will be comforted. You will know that I had to do this in order to finish my work. Now, as we begin to wrap all of this together, a seal must be placed upon the forehead. We're already told that that seal is synonymous with the name of God. That name of God is synonymous with the law of God. Now, a seal in Bible times always had three elements. It had the name of the person, the title of the person, and the territory of the person that were making the seal. And usually it was a, a wax, melted wax that would be put over a rolled document, and then they had this sort of like a barrel roll seal that they would put in there. And it would contain the name, the title, and the territory. Now, the Sabbath commandment, which is right in the heart of God's law, has those elements. The name, the title, and the territory. Exodus 20 and verse 11, For in six days the Lord, His name, made, created, that's His his title, His Creator, the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. That's His territory. Now see, many times when a message like this is presented, we jump right out of the gate and we say, the seal of God is the Sabbath commandment. Have you ever heard it presented that way? I mean, I'm not saying right out of the gate, but the, not much of a foundation is laid. But when you understand that the seal of God is His covenant worked out in your life of all the commandments written in the heart, then the Sabbath is not the seal. The Sabbath is a sign of the seal. Very different. Look at uh, Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 12. Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbath to be a what? A sign between them and me that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. I'm the one doing it. And I gave them the Sabbath as a sign. As they recognize my holy day, they are also saying, Yes, Lord, hands down. You're the one. I mean, honestly, what is the Sabbath really a sign of? When you, when you think of the Sabbath, what is it a day of? It's a day of rest, isn't it? 
Isn't God saying, on this day, the day that I've specified, hands down, put your hands down. This is not a day for you to do your thing. It's a sign of the very sanctifying process He wants to do in us, which is also hands down. Amen? Is there anything special about the Sabbath day? Does the sun shine any brighter today? Do the birds sing louder? Are there physical signs around us that the Sabbath is any different? No. The difference is, God said, on this day. And what do we do? We submit. You see, the sign of the sanctification, the Sabbath, is the perfect test. Because there's nothing in the Sabbath that outwardly says, with reason, yeah, I can see that this day is different, or I can see that it's wrong to not keep this day. No, nope, none of that exists other than God has said, it is wrong to break my Sabbath. God has said, you shall keep this day holy, specific. See, there's, there's nothing that the carnal mind can look at and say, well, I could see that it's wrong to kill. I could see that. I can see that it's wrong to steal. That, that kind of makes sense because, you know, if I steal from someone else, then they may want to steal from me. Not in the Sabbath commandment. The Sabbath commandment is purely a test of whether or not you will submit to the Word of God. And the only blessing is in submitting. Think about it this way. In the garden, there was a test. And God said, this tree, this specific tree right here, don't eat from it. Was, I mean, when Eve looked at the tree, she said, I see that it's lovely and it's desirable for food, but weren't all the other trees in the garden desirable for food? I mean, they were eating off of them, weren't they? I'm sure they were desirable. So there's nothing in the tree of itself that was so different that they would say, oh, I can see that we're not supposed to eat from that tree. Other than God said, don't eat from that one, right? It's a test. Now, it's interesting that Satan, in this scenario, uses a woman to get to Adam who represents God's people. Isn't that exactly what happens in the last days? We read that Satan, who is the dragon, uses a woman to try to defeat God's people. Same scenario. The test is just basically repeated. All right. So let's review. Revelation 7, 1 through 3. After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth or on the sea or in any tree. God is saying that He's holding back the destructive winds that are about to blow upon the earth, and He's telling the angels to hold those winds. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to the earth, to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. As we've already said, the, the only thing holding the winds is the sealing of the servants. And just because you're a servant doesn't mean that you're sealed. Just because you're a disciple doesn't mean that the law has been sealed within your mind. There is a testing process. There is a proving process. There is a work that God wants to do in you. By submitting, you have nothing to fear. By resisting, you have everything to fear. The submission is your only work in this process. God has already promised to finish it. Early Writings, page 38. I saw four angels who had a work to do on the earth and were on their way to accomplish it. Jesus was clothed with priestly garments. He gazed in pity on the remnant. Then he raised his hands and with a voice of deep pity cried, My blood, Father, my blood, my blood, my blood. Then I saw an exceedingly, or an exceeding bright light come from God who sat upon the great white throne and was shed all about Jesus. Then I saw an angel with a commission from Jesus swiftly flying to the four winds who had a work to do on the earth and waved something up and down in his hand and cried, or crying with a loud voice, Hold, 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 hold until the servants of God are sealed in their foreheads. Brothers and sisters, we're in the sealing time right now. Christ is looking with mercy upon you and I and He's crying to the Father, My blood, my blood, let, let there be time a little longer that I may finish what I have started in these people. For I have paid an awful price for them. He's crying out, my blood, my blood, hold the winds. 
I asked my accompanying angel the meaning of what I heard and what the four angels were about to do. He said to me that it was God that restrained the powers and that he gave his angels charge over things on the earth, that the four angels had power from God to hold the four winds and that they were about to let them go. But while their hands were loosening and the four winds were about to blow, the merciful eye of Jesus gazed on the remnant that were not sealed. And he raised his hands to the Father and pleaded with him that he had spilled his blood for them. Then another angel was commissioned to fly swiftly to the four angels and bid them hold until the servants of God were sealed with the seal of the living God in their foreheads. Brothers and sisters, I pray that this message has stirred something in your heart. I know that this entire week has been quite an experience for me as I've studied and saw some of the things that I presented this morning. What an eye-opener when it comes to the seal of God. What an eye-opener when we think about the days that we are living in right now. The earthquake, the dark day, the falling of the stars has already happened. The next thing in this seal is every island moving out of their place and the sky receding as a scroll and the King of Kings coming in all of His glory and power. Friends, we're in the sealing time. And the Holy Spirit is crying out to your heart. He's crying out to my heart. Submit to the potter. Submit to the potter. And He will finish the work.